What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast. Oh, wait, it's not just the Pick 6 Podcast. It's also the Cover 3 Podcast. I'm Will Brinson. I'm your host, and I'm joined by host Chip Patterson, my boy from Raleigh. It's Monday, May 10th, and we are doing a crossover pod to do a way too early 2022 NFL mock draft. Also joining us, Tom Fernelli and Ryan Wilson. I don't know how these intros are going to go, Chip. Why don't you say something, and then Tom and Ryan can chime in. Well, I, I just got to start off by, uh, you know, it's good to be back with y'all doing this. And also, I want to let the Pick 6 audience know that uh, one of the best things to to debate, you know, once spring practice wraps up, it, it gets into like the real heady, we have no answers, we have no data debates. So we're going to be doing coach rankings coming up, like a whole week of ranking the top power five coaches. Like, how do you rank coaches? No one ever agrees on that. Like, do you take <laughs> championships into consideration? Or if they were a long time ago, yeah wins fit expectations so that's why we're going to have a couple of episodes coming up here in just a little bit uh, it'll go in line with the cbssports.com coach rankings that we always roll out every single year so uh that's uh, really exciting we're also going to start reaching out to some insiders uh, to do some like post spring wrap. One of the best things we have is our partners at 24 seven sports, like boots on the ground. Like, you know, if, if you're only allowed to watch 15 minutes of, of uh, these spring practices, 24 seven sports is there watching the, at least those 15 minutes to be able to tell us whatever we can glean from that. So uh, yeah, coach rankings uh, really diving deep into uh, what we learned from these teams. It's, I, I just want to make sure that, you know, Pick six audience is going to get a little bit more free time in their head too. Sure. So, you know, come, come over and uh, hang out with us on the cover three podcast. Uh, selling. Yeah. Selling it hard. I was going to, I was going to point out Wilson that Ryan, you, that was Tom chiming in, but Ryan is, uh, Ryan's going to be leading the schedule coverage because you know, I'm out. <laughs> on schedule release. <laughs> yeah, I'm out. What you, <laughs> it's, it's no, you gotta, so what are we doing? It's, 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 it's May. Let's get out of here. Why are we releasing a schedule in May? What are we doing? Release it in April, you bleep holes. What? Got it's it. a dominate calendar. Oh, God. It's so annoying. We get oh, it. A couple things. Number one, no one's surprised that you're going to be MIA for that schedule release. Number Perfect. two, the Pick 6 listeners are already in shock that we're not babbling about nonsense. And instead, Chip has told them exactly what's going to happen over the offseason for cover three. In fact, I was I was confused. I was like, "What's Chip doing?" I was like, "Oh, he's explaining what's going to happen instead of talking about a hypothetical tattoo or." And number four, Packers. And we talked about this a little bit. I'm extremely pumped for our guy Fernelli because they finally got a quarterback in Chicago, as he noted Ooh. before we went on air, that they will ruin in short order. But for now, I feel really good about it, Tom. Yeah, Tom, yeah. open up that man. How do you how do you feel about Fields? Did uh, you, and did you think it was going to be Mac Jones for a hot second? Because I did. I was like, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> I was we, I was watching it with the wife, and you know I told her I saw I was like oh the Bears have drafted up, and she got really excited because you know she's like oh they're drafting Fields, and I told her I was like I was I was trying to be calm. I was like no, they <laughs> might take Mac Jones, and honestly, had they taken Mac Jones at twenty, I'd have been fine. If they had traded up to take Mac Jones, I might have like done like an English soccer fan and stormed the stadium, but it was just. <laughs> It's, I was very excited. I'm very happy. We talked about it when I was on for the Justin Fields draft profile that I thought the Bears were going to be in play if he started to slide, and that's exactly what happened. And I think it's it's what they needed to do. They, you can't win in the NFL without a quarterback. I don't care what you have. You, you can have a great roster, but if you've got an average QB, you're not going to win anything. Said said noted Bears historian Tom Fernelli. The Bears have not won anything. Yes. Right. I mean, you know, Rex Grossman ain't taken down Peyton Manning. Doesn't matter what Devin Hester does. Uh, by the way, Tom, uh, Pat's on our backs all around. It wasn't Mac at three. It wasn't happening. No. And I I almost I actually think for that Tom and I were the impetus. The the the, the, the podcast I'm dead serious. The podcast that we Oh, did, we know you are. This oh is something God. that you would come up with. Go ahead. No, the podcast <laughs> that Tom and I did. I mean, I, I was we were we were kind of just riffing on the Justin. We were doing it was a Justin Fields prospect podcast, but the way it unfolded, it, we were like, "This is a this is a smoke screen by the 49ers. They're not taking, and we you know it, they didn't take Fields. Obviously, they took Lance, but they're not taking Mac at three. This is not happening. This is all fake news, and we don't buy it. And as a result of that podcast, I went. That's how I ended up with literally like my house on the line against like on Mac Jones over and uh, and either Lance or Fields at three. So thank you, Tom. 
Well, yeah, 49ers fans, thank you and Tom both for making sure that didn't happen because they were extremely nervous. And you've ruined my mock draft, so thank you for that too. That's right. And, uh, by the way, my, my, my wife, AK, says to tell Chip and Tom hello. Not right. Hello. <laughs> hey, love AK. Chip Tom. Let's get to the draft. We got stuff coming up on the podcast. You should subscribe to the Pick 6 Podcast. It's a daily NFL show with lots of talk about football and things. Uh, we will do – oh, we will have win totals coming up. That is that is kind of – that's my wheelhouse. I like. By the like, way, quickly before you get going, I talked to uh, my accountant this morning, the guy who runs Breaking Bourbon. I told him, I said, oh, by the way, Brinson talked about your website for a while. I said, I would tell you the episode. I can't remember it. Please do not go way through five or six episodes trying to find it because you will kill yourself listening to – all of us talk about nothing related to football. So go ahead. Sorry. Sure to get that in there. Did, did he, was, it, was he like, does, does Brinson want a job writing about bourbon? And I'll send no, he, he said, oh, he said like that. He said, oh. We firing up the beer blog again? <laughs> no. <God. laughs> well, I See, guess, uh, we got we got Chip off off, uh, off script already. It took five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, man. You run a beer blog, you get fat real fast. <laughs> drinking free beer. So your friend writes a bourbon blog. It's he, like no, no. It's like the it's like the number one the like, definitive bourbon yeah. website. The defi- oh, bourbon! How great is me? Jesus! No, no, no. It's, 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 it's Google. If you Google basically any whiskey, that, you know, you're trying to Eric. Is this a good whiskey? The like one of the first things that pops up is Breaking Bourbon's review of it. This guy's huh. like a thing. So they got in on it early, just like you know us as bloggers back in the day, and, and they it's sort of a fan house of bourbon, exactly. True. And they parlayed that into whatever. But I don't want to sidetrack us. Go ahead. Or people who've been working here for ten years say truth. Get in there early. <laughs> yeah. Imagine if you just started your own website ten years ago. Anywho, let's move on to the twenty twenty two NFL draft. But we're first going to look at the twenty twenty one because we did this back on May first, twenty twenty. Ryan. What we, Ryan still writes in the Royal We, by the way. Just, yeah, I don't, I never switched over. I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, the, the, you, you're the last guy left. <laughs> we'll each, we'll each, I think we'll each might do it. Uh, you, you correctly called Trevor Lawrence, number one of the Jaguars. Wow, Ryan, what an amazing feat of strength that you nailed Trevor Lawrence. Couple, a couple things here. Perfect. Everyone you is should, proud of you. Great job. You tried to take credit for that in Debo. Uh, rightly slapped you across the face. I, number, to, I think I was. I was thinking I was breaking bourbon and trying to be sarcastic. And number two, as Debo likes to point out, you also had Jake Fromm going first overall in your 2019 April. Yeah, look at that face Tom just gave you. Oh, 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 up high, down hard. So I'll take Trevor Lawrence. And that was a you know that's a layup, and I, I just made the layup, so I'll take it. You also nailed uh, Justin Fields. Jamar Chase. I was like, who's Chase? Waddle? Chase, who's Chase? Jamar, <laughs> Jalen Waddle, uh, Panay Sewell, Devontae Smith, Micah Parsons, and Patrick Sertain, all in your top 11. You, in your 2021 NFL way too early mock draft, had Alex Leatherwood 20. Nice job, what? Gruden. How did I get that? How about that? Yeah, maybe maybe that's what happened. Maybe Gruden thought he was reading my last mock draft. He read my first mock draft. <laughs> he, Googled, <laughs> he Googled mock drafts and up came your way too early. And he's like, hey, these guys love Leatherwood. That Gruden, is Gruden, it. Gruden didn't do any draft prep at all. Didn't watch any film <laughs> and woke up the morning of the draft and was like, oh, man, I got I to gotta find somebody. Today's the draft. Drafts and we, say that, we say that jokingly, but considering like, the Raiders only draft players from the college football playoff national title game. Are we sure that's not what happens? Or like Gruden just wakes up one January evening and is like, Oh, I'm gonna watch this game. Oh, I'm going to draft so many of these players. I, I'm not sure that's wrong, Tom. Okay. Two things. Number one, I will ride for Alex Leatherwood. That is one of my top 30 favorite players in this draft class. I'm a sucker for the four year <laughs> players. I mean, Jonah Williams goes down with a knee injury at halftime against Georgia in the national championship game. True freshman, Alex Leatherwood. Hey dog, we need you to come play left tackle against one of the best defenses in the country. We're down to like double digits. We got to come back. He came in and owned it then moves to right guard for his sophomore season, then to left tackle, dominates at left tackle the last two years. Like I I just think that guy's a f- phenomenal football player. We'll ride for him. And number two, uh, David Roth made this joke. I thought it was hilarious. Uh, of course, John Gruden is going to take an offensive lineman with the name Leather and Wood. Like he, just, <laughs> he didn't even need to like watch any tape. He's like, Leatherwood, I like the way it sounds. <laughs> this guy's one of the toughest fellas I've ever seen in my life. A bad hombre, I'm telling you, Leatherwood. <laughs> Can the Leatherwood family make up their mind? Leather or wood? Where, where are we going? 
uh, Trey Lance, you had as a first round talent. You actually had Creed Humphrey becoming Kansas City Chief in your 2021 oh. draft, and you had the Bears drafting a quarterback. Although uh, a year ago, you had them taking Brock Purdy 14. That would have been awesome. <laughs> I am happier with the one they took. Yeah. Brock Purdy had a, you guys know this better than I do, had a terrible season last year. 2019, I, I was, I said, okay, he could be one of these guys that maybe makes a move and he made a move in the wrong direction. So I'm glad he came back. Also worth Don't. noting, Princeton, I had three guys that went undrafted uh, in this first round back in a year ago. You had Jamie Newman, number eight overall? <laughs> I don't know. That's a dunk. I just, uh, yeah, Marvin Wilson and Dylan Moses. Jamie what? Newman, talk about a guy who took an L coming back, going to, Coming yeah, back. I don't know don't. the circumstances by which he decided to not play, opt out, but I wish he played just to see him not play in that dumb boy force offense and to also see what he could do in Georgia and then, you know, over two in terms of what of him not playing. Don't Zach feel Wilson. too bad. I had I had both uh Tanner Morgan and KJ Costello in my two early mock drafts. Tanner Morgan year. was a guy that I liked too, and he had a bad year last year as well. So hopefully he and Brock can figure it out. Uh Zach Wilson and Mac Jones out of nowhere. It happens every year. There's going mm-hmm. to be somebody next year who rises out of nowhere. I thought that was going to be Jamie Newman and Brock Purdy. Joke's on me. It was not. Mm. Yes. Joke is on you as usual. So for the 2022 mock, there's no consensus quarterback, first quarterback that is going to be taken a la Trevor Lawrence. There's not going to be probably for five or 10 years that Trevor Lawrence is that good. There is, however, a little fella named <laughs> Sam Howell playing at the you know, I really think at this point for Sam Howells, I mean, he is so highly thought of that he should just sit out the year and should skip the 2022 season. He's not that good. I'll be interested to hear what Tom and and, I I just want him to not play for my own self. Oh, I see. Because I don't, I wasn't crazy. It was a bit. Okay, gotcha. Go ahead. You're not, you don't like him that much. I haven't watched a lot of them closely. I haven't, and and, uh, truthfulness, I haven't watched a lot of these guys closely unless they were going to come come out this year and just decide at the last moment to return to school. So I don't know a lot, but I've seen Sam Howell by watching the other players in that UNC team and seeing them play against other teams that I was watching, whether it was Clemson or whoever. So I, I did. I thought he was more of a gunslinger who had a ton of weapons. But what do you guys think? He's Bakerish, both in like stature and kind of approach. I, I think that I think there's a lot of talent there. I, I think that he's going to be one of the top quarterbacks taken in the draft no matter what because i mean he, he was a highly rated prospect out of co- high school going into college he's played very well he did have a lot of weapons but i do think he helped those weapons a little bit himself and i do think that he's in an offense that's going to allow him to put up good looking numbers i i think that there's i mean i i think but by the time we get the next spring the knock against him is going to be his size because that always gets used against him but we've seen you know in recent years size is becoming less of a factor at the qb position as far as what teams really care about so i like him i i think he's got a chance to be pretty damn good this is going to be fascinating because last year the north carolina offense was run to set up the pass sam howell finished ninth in the ACC in pass attempts per game. Mm, wow. In yards per attempt, first, ahead of Trevor Lawrence, 10.3 for Howell, 9.4 for Lawrence. Um, you lose Javante Williams. You lose Michael Carter. They've got uh, – I like British Brooks. He played well in the bowl game, and Ty Chandler comes in from Tennessee, but that ain't Javante Williams and Michael Carter. So after really being able to benefit from an offense that I thought was run to set up the pass with, I mean, Deami Brown, Daz Newsome, phenomenal targets on the outside. Josh Downs is going to be your North Carolina wide receiver that you're going to want to take note of. Who's going to have a tall guy. He's going to have a big time. Number 11, big time breakout season. This he's year. The, the big guy, Josh Downs. How big you do you think is big? You got to go with. He like, looked like he was like six four. That's, the, this is a college football writer talking to a draft writer. <laughs> is he yeah, he's guy? not big. He's, I, don't, okay. I would not call him the big guy. I don't I have, they had they had a tall weapon on the outside that I would catch my attention. Okay, yeah, I don't know the guys that aren't coming out, Brinson. I mean, I'm not. Uh, Josh Downs five ten, so not. Big. Okay, yeah, not, not he's not the guy I was thinking about. All there's right, big. There's a big. big are you sure said that? Wouldn't Daz Newsom big? No, he Oak was a, no, he's, he's a big old boy. That's, I just that's love the name British Brooks. I, I, that is just a great you. A name. But that anyway. sounds like a radio host in Worcester, Mass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how this year is going to be, Like, I, I think that there's a lot of, um, he, he will either like thrive with more responsibility or he's going to have a, a little bit of a heat check. So that's, uh, that's going to be the most interesting thing about how and how the next year goes for him from an NFL draft perspective. 
No, that's a good point because sometimes you can go from having all those weapons and very few expectations to being overwhelmed by those expectations once the players aren't there and you're in the spotlight as a potential top five pick and sometimes it goes sideways. So I'll be, I'll be interested. To see we could also works. play really well, but then there's enough like that gets put on tape. Again, it when we talk about Sam Howe and the yardage totals that he's put up across his first two seasons to go back and realize that he was ninth in pass attempts per game in, and as many possessions as they play, as fast as they play, you wouldn't expect to see that. But it was a, it was without a doubt an offense that first wanted to let Williams and Carter get going and then open things up from there. And Carolina was very bizarre last year in that they were a big time second half team. And they've kind of been that way since Matt came back. You know, they had spots where, was it last year? Maybe it was the year before where they were losing to Wake Forest. In like you know, it, it, like badly at halftime, and then just sprint. You know, Wake didn't have a good defense. They just sprinted back and, and and won the game. I think they won the game. Maybe I can't remember. But my point being is that Carolina played really, really well in the second half of games. And oftentimes, Sam Howell wouldn't have big numbers until they sort of had to uncork him because of a oh, freshman year. He was Mister Fourth Quarter. Yeah, oh, that's what okay. yeah, yeah, freshman year. He would like North Carolina. He would play poorly in the second quarter. And then in the fourth quarter, just it like lights out. Fire. Yeah. I like the so I always talk about how Danny Kelly does shades of for his draft things because you know, doing direct comps is just a it's just it's just not gonna work out for anybody, the, the player, the draft, the draft analyst, whatever. Loose Baker Mayfield. It's like a Tom a just said. Baker Mayfield, like a that that, that I like that, Tom. I like the, I like the Baker Mayfield comp. Uh, it, Wilson, I'm going number two to the Lions in this mock draft. By the way, Spencer Rattler, the next quarterback off the board, uh, Oklahoma. Spencer Rattler, number eight to the Washington Football Team. Wilson, what? Uh, why? How'd you How'd you decide on that one? I, I'm a couple things to know. This is a mock draft in which it should probably be better served calling it a players to watch list because mock drafts at this point are insane. And there's no Chase Young or Bosa Brothers or Trevor Lawrence to sort of top the draft board. So I'm just basically throwing darts. I'll be honest okay. with you. All right. Um, but Spencer Rattler is a guy who – How about I ask this instead? Tom, is is Ryan stupid for having Spencer Rattler eighth overall to Washington? There you go. Uh, No, but I'm probably also the wrong person to ask because as Chip can attest to, <laughs> I am currently on the Spencer Rattler's not even the best quarterback on Oklahoma train. Ooh, I love it. <laughs> Caleb think, Williams. Yeah. Wow. Incoming freshman Caleb Williams, I think, is a better quarterback than Rattler. But that's not to say that Rattler isn't a good NFL first round type of quarterback because, as we're seeing in college these days, every single good quarterback goes to one of five schools anyway, and they're all on the same school until one of them has to transfer. I do. I like Rattler. I think that Rattler, as far as the pedigree of the offense he's in and what Lincoln Riley has helped develop with quarterbacks with Baker Mayfield, with Kyler Murray, what he helped do for Jalen Hurts' his NFL draft stock, I think that Rattler is a guy that's going to improve, and we could easily see him being like the Heisman winner in 2021. So it wouldn't shock me at all if he's Is there any way, there. Tom, that he doesn't start or he loses his job? Oh, no. He's going he's gonna to okay. have the job. I, I think that Caleb Williams is going to sit this year, and the plan there is Rattler's going to leave, and then Williams steps in and is ready. And but, he's going to be better. And then he'll be better. Yeah. And I do think that if Rattler got hurt, I don't know if he'd get the job back. Mm. Well, JT Daniel situation. I uh, Spencer Rattler is a player who I think – is going to end up with a higher NFL draft uh, position than necessarily I personally like him, like in my sort of like my own flavor of, uh, of of the quarterback because the Oklahoma wide receiver room is absolutely stacked, uh, even more so that like much deeper than it was with Jalen Hurts, as deep as it was with um, Kyler Murray or Baker Mayfield. And so I think the numbers are just going to be ridiculous. And, and that is going to fuel the Heisman train, which is going to fuel the NFL draft machine. But at the same time, it's like the, the kind of player who, even if you talk to some Oklahoma fans, they would be like, yeah, I mean, he's good, but, you know, and then just sort of have like a list of uh, complaints. Now he could show a lot of growth, but I do think that the, the way that last season went for him had enough flashes of uh, some really frustrating and confounding play that if that's not totally ironed out, it's still going to pop up from time to time. And uh, and that's where you're going to love him for what he can do for you. But uh, we'll see. He's He's still got some development left. And the book on him goes two ways. There's the first side 
that is very promotional and obviously from people who love Rattler who say he had such a good attitude coming in and Jalen Hurts was there and he just said he wanted to learn, you know, and he really sat there and he really soaked it all up. And then there's another side that's like, yeah, I don't even know if Rattler's the best quarterback in that room. Like mm -hmm. Tom's kind of like on that kick, but there's also, uh, there also definitely seems to be a little bit of, skepticism around uh how how much of a complete and like truly dominant player he is yeah. so uh, <laughs> oh i was just gonna say quickly so full disclosure in the case that this wasn't clear i haven't watched these guys closely just because they weren't in the mix but one of the things sort of following up what you said uh chip is that rattler is is cocky or arrogant is, is that at all a concern from where you guys are watching I don't think I try not to. That's why I said the book on him goes two ways because I've yeah. heard people close to the program that are promoting this like team first, you know, kind of narrative. And then you also hear the other side of it. And I'm willing to give enough grace and enough room for, I don't know, aging, maturity, yeah. like just figuring out how to iron out things and figuring out how to take care of your business. It's unique that he's the only one of these quarterbacks that Lincoln recruited right out of high school. You know, so maybe these other players came in having learned some lessons along the way that made him be a little bit of a better fit. I hope he is cocky and arrogant. I don't want a quarterback that isn't. <laughs> Moxie Mayfield was when we initially came up with the. I mean, yeah, there's, but I mean, even, uh, just look at Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady. They're not exactly, you know, like. And John and John Breach's uh, defense, Andy Dalton. <laughs> yeah. I'm not being Oklahoma quarterback. You got Baker. Kyler Hurts, your father, you're Spencer, and also your name's Spencer Rattler. Like it's a good name. It's, it's a great, great name. name. How does he not have a snake tattoo on his that's, arm? Uh, he's the varsity blues like opposing quarterback. Yes, that, that's Spencer yes. Rattler. He's or he's the villain. He he comes off looking like the quarterback of the team that my high school is playing. <laughs> or like right. when you make, when you think of like Friday Night Lights when they would make like the names that they would come up with you'd be like Voodoo Tatum come on that's not a real name and then in real life there's Spencer Rattler <laughs> it is it, it sounds like a fake Friday Night Lights name that's good the yes, uh, uh, Key and Peel touchdown dance guys mm -hmm. you know what you can't make up though is Keaton Slovis you had him going number nine to the Raiders Wilson the USC quarterback is Tom is USC good enough for I, I don't I don't I just assume USC is going to be hyped up before the season. Right? It's, it's a trick question. I mean, I don't, I don't know. USC, Clay Helton, what are we doing here, pal? I mean, USC is good enough from a talent perspective. Right, right. They will finish. They'll finish twenty fourth or something in the in the in the final poll and and beat some. Like, they'll lose a game they're not supposed to lose because of their coaching, and they'll win a bunch of other games. But no, it. I mean, Kadan Slovis is going to be really Kadan? interesting this year. Yeah, Keaton. is it Keaton? I mean, I've always called him Kadan. Right? I, know, I just let it fly. I, I, I mispronounce everything, so I just assumed that Tom was right. If he's I love Kadan. I'm going to start calling him Kadan. Well, is Call he gonna be, will he be a Keaton or a Kadan? It's going to be interesting to find out in 2021 because, like, last year, and it's weird because with the college season last year, it's hard to know what to take seriously and whatnot just because, especially in the Pac-12, with, like, the, the, the way that they had to deal with their season being postponed and the weird ramp up to it. But to me, last year, he didn't look healthy. Right, And his arm strength was kind of sapped because this is a kid as a freshman who played so well that JT Daniels, who was one of the top, you know, QB rank in that class with Fields and Lawrence, transferred to Georgia because he knew he wasn't going to get that starting gig back. And Slovis last year, I think the defense is adjusted, as you see with, you know, air raid teams like you saw it, Chip, you mentioned it like that, that BYU game. Everybody just starts dropping eight back. That was in 2019. Everybody was doing that last year and he had to adjust and he was trying to force some things. And I don't think he had the zip on his ball that he had in his freshman year. So this is going to be a really interesting season for me for Slovis for as far as his NFL draft future, just seeing how he adjusts to the way defenses are playing with him and seeing if he's healthy. Yeah. I uh, I was just going to say quickly, I think the elbow injury was something that affected his confidence. And the thing that blew me away about him the year before, freshman year, he outplayed Justin Herbert in that USC Oregon game. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't even close. Justin Herbert got hot in, in the second half. But the first 30 minutes, it was all Keaton Slovis, which you know left an impression on me. So I, I know he can play at that level. But we see quarterbacks all the time, especially early in their career, go off. And then they sort of uh, re regress to mediocrity. So I, I think you're right, Tom. I think the injury is probably weighing on him. If he's healthy, I think we'll see a different quarterback. Did you get that? Uh, confidence is a word that he's used. Los Angeles Times uh, had a, 
a breakdown of uh, all the at the end of spring practice, and he said that Slovis has even been talking to reporters, admitting that he's been trying to trying to work on his confidence. It was something that he knew was a. Uh, you know, not all there. He's trying to he's trying to recapture his form. He's trying to get everything back together. And listen, uh, when you look at that like wide receiver room, you you got pros there. I mean, it is going to be very very easy for him to if he gets everything rolling, rise up the draft board just because of the way that that USC team is built. They're not incredibly deep. Like if they all of a sudden start getting some injuries, then it could be difficult. But Drake London, not Amon Ross St. Brown, was the leading receiver on that team last year. Brew McCoy, former five-star player who's been trying so hard to get healthy. A lot of people are expecting a big breakout from him. Gary Bryant Jr. is absolutely terrifying in the slot. And uh, they've got a guy named, I don't know if he's Michael Jackson Jr. or Michael Jackson the third. And as somebody with a suffix, I'm very concerned that we get this right. But uh, I just, I love USC's wide receivers and especially in the air raid system. I, I like if Slovis gets, gets his swag back, he's going to be great. But if he gets a little banged up, he might get Wally pipped by his backup, a guy named Jackson Dart. Jackson Dart, Spencer Rattler. The names. Of I'm, the if, I'm, if I'm if I'm keyed on or cut on or keto or whatever his name is, Slovis. I am petrified of a guy named Jackson Dart Linger. His name's Keaton Slovis. He's doing okay. No, Keaton, Keaton, Slovis, Keaton Slovis sounds like the guy running a poker room at a at a Czechoslovakian like bar in down Midtown New York or something. Uh, Keaton Slovis is six two and beautiful. He's fine. <laughs> like the, the thing <laughs> is, is like, he's he's funny. Funny. He he should be able to get this confidence back. Just look in the mirror, Keaton. Come on, baby. Let's do it. Also, talk about a, that's a red flag. If you're if you're six two and beautiful, and the quarterback at Southern Cal, and you're lacking confidence, what? No, I, think, what I think you can what admit to like for confidence. I I like it if you're if you're gonna admit that yeah, like and confidence can be like knowing the right throw. I mean, it's your decision making within the system. So I'll. I will. Uh, I appreciate him at least like letting us in because, like Tom said, he didn't look right, and that actually adds some context. And it's like, okay, you you weren't right. You know, you've got stuff that you're working on that has made it be different than the results that we saw from you as a freshman. And, and I'm obviously kidding. It's if if you can say any if you're lacking confidence after the last year, that's anybody can be lacking confidence, especially if you have an arm injury you're trying to come back from. Also, if you you know not really on campus anymore, so you know sort of lose your U.S. Yeah. also did go five and zero in the regular season. Only lost in the Pac-12 championship game. Shut it down. Did not play a bowl game. Mm -hmm. I saw. Actually, I didn't see it. I watched it on television because it was twenty twenty. But Malik Willis out of Liberty. You have him going number ten to the Panthers. Wilson, a little short drive. It's a short drive, I think. Uh, Tom, is there a chance that Malik Willis ends this season as the number one quarterback in this draft? Ooh wee. A chance, yeah, but I think Malik Willis is more likely to be the Jamie Newman of this Ooh, than boy, that's I, a slap in the face. <laughs> I just, it's like, I mean, there's the, thing, and this is probably like this is one of those situations where I might be too close to the situation to really see the bigger picture. But I think of Malik Willis, and I think of the guy who couldn't beat out Bo Nix at Auburn, and Yikes. I don't like Bo Nix in the slightest. Like I've been tra not you know who else takes Bo Nix? Bo Nix. <laughs> Seth, Seth Williams and Anthony Schwartz hate Bo Nix as well. Exactly. I've been dogging Bo Nix for the last few years. So I, it's hard for me to get over that. But at the same time, maybe Malik Willis's arm was just too strong for what Chip <laughs> refers to as Gus Melzahn's <laughs> pop gun offense. But like I, I look at Malik Wilson, he does have a big arm. and I, But I, I see like a Zach Wilson kind of situation here where it's like, I get it. I like the tools. I understand what people do like about him. But like, did we pay attention to who Liberty played last year? Like, yeah. it was what it's they played, Syrac right now. played Syracuse. Yeah, Syracuse had like literally their entire defense opted out. Syracuse was pretty much using walk-ons and like media students, broadcast students to play in the secondary. Everybody was tearing them apart. Like, and you, you see the games against NC State. He really struggled. Two touchdowns, three interceptions. Against Coastal, another top defense. No touchdowns, two interceptions. So he did complete like 66% of his passes. Virginia Tech, he played pretty well against, but Virginia Tech wasn't really the Virginia Tech we're used to, and they were missing Caleb Farley. So that secondary was hurting last year. And then as far as the other games, Western Kentucky, FIU, North Alabama, ULM, Southern Miss, Western Carolina, UMass. These are like some of the worst teams at the FBS level. So <laughs> I think this is going to be a very important season for Malik Willis against hopefully stiffer competition to really show us what he's got.
Yeah, two touchdowns. I'm not going to chime in and say that Tom can't recognize an elite defense when he sees one in Raleigh. That's fine. No big deal. Uh, I mean, I think it's two touchdowns and five interceptions against the toughest defenses he played. Coastal Carolina and Mm -hmm. NC State were the toughest defenses he played. Virginia Tech was ravaged by COVID availability issues all season, and they kind of mailed in that game just a little bit. But uh, like like Zach Wilson, uh, he struggled against San Diego State, struggled against Coastal Carolina. You know, you start to connect these dots and – um, this is, listen, the cover three listeners right now, I'm not, I'm not going to harp on it too long, but I'd, I'd like to see you play well against your best competition. That's also, fair. Also, another I'm thing too, like Dan. Hugh Freeze QBs tend to put up numbers. Mm. Swag Kelly. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Does Hugh Freeze have anybody who's gone to the NFL level? Well, I mean, wasn't Kelly there for a hot sec? He yeah, was. Until he, until he, until he crashed that Halloween party and fell on somebody's couch drunk or whatever he was on which time so you know that that was like last year right or it's 20 it would have been 2019 it would have been 2020 he he's, like he's not called broncos. chill kelly boys he's called swag kelly for a reason <laughs> That's right. they had a broncos team halloween party and kelly afterwards left he was dressed up like a cowboy maybe which makes total sense and Busted into some random house and passed out on their couch. <laughs> they came out and Chad Kelly, Swag Kelly's in a cowboy outfit, asleep on the couch. Desmond Ritter, the other quarterback in Wilson's first round mock, 26 overall to the Denver Broncos. You buying or selling Desmond Ritter's a first round pick, Tom? Mm-hmm. Right now, I kind of buy it. Oh, I, you I, like that better than Malik? Okay, good. I want to hear this. Go for it. I think like Desmond was really impressive last year and he was somebody who coming into the season, I was, you know, I looking at Cincinnati, I was like uh, Desmond Ritter watching him his freshman year. I was like, okay, this is, this is a kid who can run. You ask him to throw, there's really nothing there, but he really took a huge leap into 2020 where as far, I, I don't think he's got an elite arm. I don't think he has a great arm, but I think he's got enough of a blend of both his legs and his arm. And he was really used well in that offense for what his strengths are. That this is a guy where I think now there's actual projection to it. And if we see that same kind of improvement in 2021, I think that this is a kid that could be a first round. I think that he's probably more likely to be a second or third round guy, but I see first round potential here very well, especially because, you know, it's the quarterback position. Teams are always going to be reaching on him as it is. So you feel better about Des Ritter now or Jamie Newman a year ago at this time? Des Ritter. Oh, okay. I, I felt better I, about Newman a year ago than I do about Ritter now, but I echo you, Tom, that I feel so much better about Ritter than I did one year ago. And there was all this, uh, oh, he was he was hurt. He was hurt the whole season. He never really got to go. And he had a full season of health, and it was absolutely fantastic. If If you're watching right now on YouTube, you can see it. And that run from about the SMU game on through maybe the ECU game, they they had done it. They're like, Desmond Ritter's running and passing performance over this four-game span is the best four-game span for a quarterback running and passing since Lamar Jackson. Mm. Like, we like love game notes when it's like, Desmond Ritter, basically Lamar Jackson, <laughs> according to this four-game sample size. <laughs> but I will take, like, as, you know, small sample side jokes aside, like, he was, he was really, really good last year. And I don't think that Cincinnati, like, it, we're talking about a lot of these quarterbacks and I immediately start to talk about the skill positions. I don't think that they're like super elite at the skill positions. So he does have to make a lot of things happen within the context of that offense. And you think he does a good job of it. I will say one concern though, is like in that sugar bowl against Georgia, which was far and away the best defense he faced. He didn't turn the ball over, but his yards per attempt dropped to 5.6 in the game. And he's rushing wise. He wasn't really able to do anything. That said, that was a very good Georgia defense. So I don't want to hold that too much against him. Uh, uh, Chip, Chip, I like how Chip accidentally dragged. It's definitely a CBS Sports Network crew that was putting up those graphics. So like, because I mean, that's, I mean, right? Cincinnati's always no, on no, 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 game notes. I'm talking about because the SIDs. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, you know, you, I've got to write, listen, I've got to write a lot of how to watches during the week. <laughs> you know, we got to do a lot of how to watch posts. <laughs> and those game notes really, really come through to be able to give you the storylines for how to watch posts. We've really, how to watch those them. are. Those are really artistically fulfilling to write. It makes, you, it, makes you, it, makes you, it makes you think to yourself, wow, I'm glad I've chosen this profession, this vocation in my life. Yeah. That I can write how to watch. Thank you, SIDs. I love all of the factoids. I need them. They, they fulfill me. 
SIVs are basically writing this how to watch this. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you. If by you the way, quickly. To, 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 by the way, you're by the way. This is the difference between Chip and you. Like Chip finds the positive in how to watch this, and you're like, "F the how to watch this. I'm not doing that." No. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the uh, <laughs> speaking of speaking of impressive performances, man, what a deep and rich uh, prospect profile that was on CBSSports.com of uh, Desmond Ritter. Is to uh, I mean just you know the headshot, the deep game logs, the notes. Oh my goodness, why would you not dive into that? Anywho, let's take a break. I don't know why I'm dragging, I'm just firing shots off it. Whatever. <laughs> uh, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk. We'll we'll discuss whether or not the defensive prospects in this class are worthy of top picks. So in Wilson's mock draft, you have Kayvon Thibodeau. That's, that's the name I get right. That's the name I can't screw up. It's, it's amazing somehow. Uh, Kayvon Thibodeau going number one overall to the Houston Texans out of Oregon. I don't I don't understand how he's not a player for LSU, but I will go with it. Huh. And, and uh, Derek Stingley. Mario who, Cristobal, player. that's how. <laughs> What's that? I said Mario Cristobal, that's how. Hmm. And uh, Derek Stingley going number three overall. Cornerback third overall would be pretty shocking, but Stingley has been a guy, Tom, that, that is, as Wilson writes here, on NFL radar since his freshman season. Uh, are these the top two defensive prospects in this draft class? I think right now, yeah. I, I think I was actually kind of mad at you, Wilson, when I saw your first mock head Thibodeau on there because I was I thought it was hot takey when I was on the Cover 3 podcast saying that he's going to be the first non-QB Ooh. taken first overall since Miles Ooh. Garrett because I honestly, going in, and again, like you said earlier, at this point of the year, you don't really know. but No idea. <laughs> going At this point of the year, for me, I think he's the best player in college football. Oh, there I we go. I think that he's going to be, I think that as the season goes on, because he's been really good his freshman year, he's really good his sophomore year, although, again, Oregon, I think, played like five games. The Pac-12 was just dumb, so it's hard to really get a read <laughs> on it. But I think giving him a full season, this is the year where he's really going to explode, and it's hard for him because he plays at Oregon to become like a national name because Oregon games aren't on in the middle of the afternoon on ABC or on CBS. They're on late at night. Nobody gets to watch them. So I, I think that this is the year where he's really going to explode on the scene nationally. And people are going to start realizing who he is because this, this kid's a monster. Like he is a tremendous defensive end. He is exactly who teams are looking for as far as that edge rusher that you need to get after quarterbacks these days. He checks every single box there is. And I think that he's going to be the number one pick in the draft next year. I think he would have been the first edge rusher taken this year, assuming Jalen Phillips is medicals. Everyone were, wasn't happy with him. I, I think mm -hmm. he would have been number one there. Oh God. Yeah. It would, I don't even think there'd have been a question. He'd have been a top five pick this year. Right. Yeah. Agree. I mean, he's, he's the Leo meme. You just point like you, as soon as the ball is snapped, you can immediately see <laughs> like him coming off the edge. It's terrible. I, I just wish I could have watched like practices of him going against Panay Sewell. Mm hmm. Mm. I will say this. Uh, people were knocking Elijah Barrett Tucker for his performance against Thibodeau. I thought actually ABT did, did pretty, pretty well. Decent. Yeah. I thought so too. I was impressed because he's a guard by nature. He has short arms or whatever the complaints are. And he kicked out. I thought he did a really good job playing left tackle. And I thought he did well in that game. What about Stingley, Chip? Uh, I mean, this guy, I mean, like, it, it, by the way, talk about names. Derek, I mean, like, like Stingley. Wish he was a safety, yeah. Ooh, yeah. It just, it just seemed. What if you put him in Pittsburgh and he, and it, like, he's the only guy who wears the B uniforms? Every <laughs> that would be awesome. And change his name, first name to Crusher, Crusher Stingley Jr. Crusher, yeah. Crusher Stingley. Um, he Smash Stingley. I, I think that he, uh, he could use some. Remember, new defensive coordinator last year, Bo Pelini, and it worked out so well they fired him after just one year. <laughs> you know, so like it was, uh, we should take that into consideration as context for why Derek Singley, you know, didn't dominate as much last season, but he could use a good year. He could use a good year. I think LSU fans would like to see him finish his career. Uh, he doesn't necessarily need to play right at the level he was when he was one of the best when he was one of the best pro prospects as a fr like to your point you'd look at that uh the on the sec on cbs that was the you know lsu championship run and you would be like man that's that is the best future pro on the field i uh i think that you know if he's fully if he can be fully healthy through the season i think he, he could use a, a good season to be able to anchor this but even still i mean the he's got all he's got all the pieces Hey, Chip, let me ask you this, because uh, 
Stingley played with Christian Fulton and Grant Delpin. I thought Stingley was better than both those guys who were second right. round picks. Is there any feeling after a down year last year? This isn't a Sean Wade situation, right? I don't think so. I even think that Sean Wade kind of Sean Wade probably got hurt by the Big Ten delayed season. Mm-hmm. And he moved from inside to outside where he just got routinely he torched. Got cooked. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely cooked. I mean, There's, that's that playoff, like some of those playoff ooh. footages, I mean, were bad for him. That's the uh, Jonah Hill gif. You're like doing cut. cut yeah. <laughs> There, there's so much like off the field stuff too with LSU last year. Like not, you know, Ooh. it's like Bo Pelini was a disaster, obviously on the defensive side for them as far as schematically, but it was just like, that was a locker room that I think kind of checked out really quickly and really early in the year. Like there was, you know, they, the defense, I don't think trusted its coach. I don't think the entire locker room trusted its head coach. There was just a lot of weird kind of stuff going on in that locker room that I wait, think, you mean it's weird for Terrace Marshall to opt out right before the Alabama game and he's trying yeah. to get drafted. That's weird. Exactly. So like the, the, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in there that it's, I think this is a big year for Stingley. And I think that, I mean, talent wise, I would agree with you. He was probably like in that secondary a few years ago, which is filled with NFL players. I thought he was the most talented one. Mm-hmm. Should, I mean, this is it's way too early to be talking about this, but is this draft class kind of? Eh? I think we need to wait for the Zach Wilsons and Mac Jones of the world to show themselves, and then because that will is what everything will revolve around. Because no one's going to get excited outside of us four talking about Thibodeau going first overall. I, I think that's what the NFL is looking for. Well, I mean, just looking through your mock draft, and again, I mean, obviously things can things will change, things can change. There's going to be people are going to be at football games this year. There's going to be more scouting. There's I would I would I would assume too that like some of these guys that are that are going to pop up on the radar haven't popped yet because of the 20, you know there's a lack of people at 2020 football games you know like some of these names that that are on the NFL radar will be more prominent moving forward but really the first skill position guy you have going is Chris Olave the Ohio State wide receiver at 13th overall Tom do you think there's any chance that we see I don't want to insult Wilson's mock draft here, but is there any way that this is grounded in any form or fashion of reality? No, it's a, it's a player to keep an eye on. So no, it's not, but go ahead, Tom. No, it's no. a mock draft. We're going to hold you to it. I mean, <laughs> it's, 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 from, I no, will murder you right. after it's wrong. Right. I have great news and horrible news for you. <laughs> the great news is you don't have to write another mock draft until next spring. I'm absolving you of that. The bad news is you got to stick with the one you put out. I, okay. I, I, I think that, Actually, I think uh, ALC on uh, on Friday's podcast, Jason Lock and Fora issued a ruling uh, as a as a uh, as close super, not quite a full super friend, but a, you know a friend of the super friends. He said that if J- Wilson gets four mock drafts deep before Breach submits the tattoo drawing for Ryan for Wilson's Ryan Finley tattoo, that it is now on Breach. Breach has to get the tattoo. So Wilson, you might want to get mocking, buddy. I got gotcha. you. That, that's the motivation for Breach to get get getting. Breach All right, go ahead, Tom. Kicker videos on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> Na- <laughs> naked. I I don't. I mean, it's weird because we're going to see guys emerge, like Ryan was just saying. So the receiver class, I don't think, has the same kind of sex appeal that this year's receiver class did. But I think that that's because this was a truly special and unique kind of receiver class. As far as Chris Olave, number thirteen, I'm not sure. I don't think Olave is the best receiver on Ohio State. I think Garrett, Garrett Wilson, Wilson is. Ooh, really? Yes, yeah, I like I, Olave. I think. Oh, I like Olave too. But I I think that's the that's the whole point of Ohio State's receiving core is they are the Alabama this year. Their entire wide receiver unit is just ridiculous from top to bottom, and I think that's going to show up as the season goes on. I like Wilson being somebody who climbs his way into the top ten. I still think Olave could be a top fifteen, maybe even a top ten mm-hmm. pick, depending on how that goes. I think that Ohio State's going to have two receivers taken in the first round, probably the first twenty picks next year. Nice. Agree, hundred hey, percent. Hey, Chip, let me ask you this. Um, A name that kept popping, I haven't watched him yet, but uh, I've heard that Traylon Burks is the best wide receiver in college football. Ooh, that's I I would say probably Garrett Wilson gets uh, gets a nod there. Traylon Burks is probably one of the most proven and sure thing wide receivers in the SEC. I'll give you that. Okay. But I'm... I'm not necessarily ready to put him up against uh, either of those two Ohio State wide receivers or, and I'm kind of waiting to see which of the group pops for Oklahoma. And, and this mm-hmm. isn't necessarily NFL draft, but um, there's there's still a couple of potentials there. Jaden Hazelwood is the one everyone's super excited about. And I think Hazelwood might be a third-year player, so maybe he flashes and just ends up bouncing. Is, did Rambo come back too? Charleston Rambo's at Miami. At Miami. Oh, okay. Definitely. And he's going to have a big year for, with Derek King. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also you, it's do you think to keep you your automatically attitude. get drafted if your name is Rambo? It feels like anyone you should can, be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, come on again. Voodoo Tatum. Who the hell has that name? Charleston Rambo. <laughs> Charleston but, Rambo. <laughs> I well, think another day to keep like, an eye out too. Conceived, you conceived like while your parents were watching Rambo and in- <laughs> too much information. <laughs> who 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 drew first? But never mind. Um, <laughs> I think another day to keep an eye out. He got injured, so there's a question of whether he's going to how healthy he's going to be for the season. But George's George Pickens is mm-hmm. a very talented receiver coming off. He's got injured ACL right now. If he's able to get on the field this fall for a decent amount of time, I think in that offense with JT Daniels, that's a name that could emerge as a first round pick. Or it could be a situation not all that dissimilar from Jamar Chase, where he opts out of the season because of that injury and just decides to start getting ready for the draft. What about what do you guys think of Justin Ross? Because neck injury, that's a huge concern. He would have been he was on the first round radar until obviously he got injured. He's coming back. Like, what can we expect? Is this going to be 50% Justin Ross, 95% Justin Ross? You guys have any so He's moving to a new, when it was him and T Higgins, they just had them both lined up on the outside. And because you trusted Trevor Lawrence, he would just chuck up 50, 50 balls because you've got like pro 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 and it would work against most ACC defenses. The word coming out of Clemson is that as he's making his return, he's got a big doctor's appointment coming up in June. That's okay. going to end up deciding whether or not he's going to be ready to go for fall camp. But in spring practice, he was going through some drills and they're going to put him at slot. They're going to put a Joe, a Joe and Joseph Nagata, like all these like big old Cadillacs on the outside. And they're going to let Justin Ross at six, three cook from the slot. I mean, DJ Uyunga Lale is just going to have wealth of options uh, in that Clemson passing attack. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch. And since they lose Travis Etienne, and I like a couple of the running backs that are coming up behind them, but I don't necessarily feel confident in them. I think that we see a lot more short pass, like, you know, pass as an extension of the run game type situation for DJ and for, uh, for Clemson. I also mentioned, I said his name earlier, Drake London, USC. I would like, I I think Drake London, USC could end up being like right there in that uh, top wide receiver discussion it's really Clemson. exciting that clemson is the new alabama it's just thrilling like this is like oh look you lose trevor Lawrence, travis Etienne, uh you know uh amari rogers oh what's that we have a five-star quarterback a five-star wide three like a six three slot guy <laughs> that's, well, that's no just what alabama, alabama clemson and ohio state do now that's well daniel sweeney is from alabama and he is the walking embodiment of rudy the movie so i think that's sort of his and also movie. clemson's defense is the best thing about it Hey, let me ask you guys this quickly because I know you guys have to go to your own podcast. Oh, yeah. uh, last last thoughts on John Mechie. Like, is he going to be legit or is he a, a sort of a, a Terrace Marshall type who's just living, uh, riding on the coattails, perceivably of you know Jamar Chase and Justin Je- uh, Justin Jefferson and LSU? I don't know yet. I don't. I I think that there's definitely probably he did benefit obviously from being in that offense with those guys, but he still played well even after Jalen Waddle went down and he had to take on a large role as the number two. Oh, that sounds like Mac Jones. But go ahead. Yeah, but I, I, I do think <laughs> uh, it will it will be interesting if he is the number one guy. It will be interesting seeing if he's able to put up those kind of numbers. And I think it's it's also hard to really know with Alabama this year, too, because they are going from Steve Sarkeesian to Bill O'Brien as their offensive coordinator. So we don't know exactly what the offense is going to look like, because I do think that Steve Sarkeesian did an amazing job getting yep, his guys good. open last year. Ajay Hall. I think might end up yeah. being the best wide receiver for Alabama this year, not John Mechie. That doesn't mean that he won't get drafted. Doesn't mean that he won't be a good pro prospect. But um, I think the uh, the young ones are, uh, are are the ones I'm more excited about in terms of actually being difference makers. And Jaleel Billingsley is uh, is he's a name to know. That's yeah. uh, that's Tom's guy right there. So he's I, a Kyle Pitts tight end, and that he's not there to be playing playing tight end. Yeah, he's block. not there to block anybody. <laughs> right. So it, when you've got all these other talented pieces, the little, and I don't even know if John Mechie's like all of that little, but he seems diminutive sometimes compared to the rest of his Alabama teammates. I don't know if uh, the little Canuck is going to end up being the alpha in that room. Is he Canadian? Will, yeah. Yeah. I, I will say something that could be somewhat of an indicator there too is Ohio State. Jamison Williams is a was a highly rated re- receiver who had originally went to Ohio State. He just transferred out and he went to Alabama. So if he's leaving Ohio State for Alabama, that might tell us that Alabama feels like it has a bigger need at that position, and also he feels like there's a clearer path to playing time. Yeah, in Alabama. Good point. That's a great point. You don't leave Ohio State as a wide receiver and go to Bama. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking you're for playing sure. time and then going to Alabama, it kind of like raises an eyebrow. 
Right. Is it, and I know you guys have to go, but I'm curious, do you think that the sort of lack of wide receiver, is it possible that the last two years we've had just this flood of good wide receivers coming to the NFL from college? And as a result, is, is the, is, is there like a, are there less great wide receivers at college? Are we just due for a year where there's just not as many or is it, or is it more of a COVID, you know, we didn't maybe don't know all these names quite yet situation. It's probably a combination of all those factors. I, I, I don't think we're going to end up, we're going to see the end of this wave of receivers anytime soon, because I think that as the offenses evolve across all levels of football and just as the way the game evolves, that receivers are becoming more and more important. So you're going to see more and more of your best players are being, your best athletes are being put at receiver. And I, so I think that we're going to see it now. Will every class be as good as maybe the last class or last two classes were? I don't know, but I still think we're going to be seeing solid receiver classes year after year. I mean, Keishon Butte at LSU, like it, it might be cyclical, like based on recruiting and draft classes, and we might see a, a little single year dip, but there were players who were freshmen and sophomores this past season in college football that I, I think are going to end up showing out such that even if it's a one year dip, the receiver class of 2023 is going to be absolutely loaded. All right. Good stuff. Uh, go check out Ryan Wilson's way too early 2022 mock draft. He has guaranteed us that he will get at least 78% of the prospects in the first round. Correct. Or he will get another, he will get a, he will get a cover three podcast tattoo on his buttocks. Yes. You guys get to pick the cheek live on YouTube. Yeah. You yeah. get to pick the cheek. Ooh. <laughs> Tom, if yeah, 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 yeah. the uh, anyway, go listen to the Cover Three podcast with Chip and Tom and Danny Cannell and uh, our, I guess now is Bud Bud, you come back on and Bud, 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 yeah, sorry, Bud too. Yeah, no, we we are the only podcast at CBS with our own coaching tree, so uh, step your game up. Mm -hmm. Hey, anchor down, baby. Let's go. Let's go. We are all we stand for Vandy in this house. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have that. a lawyer, Brinson. You got to point out we have a lawyer now. But we have a lawyer. No, Sean. He doesn't yeah. count. Yeah, he's, he's, a lawyer. he's a lawyer. Why would anybody ever want to claim Sean? Sean's going to end up like <laughs> interning for Clay Travis at out lay, layout kick or whatever the the Fox like spout off will be. Like seriously, who goes from blogger to lawyer? It's supposed to be lawyer to blogger. <laughs> what the hell is Sean doing? <laughs> what you right. do is you you have your failed legal career and quit it for to write about sports for no money. You don't write about sports for no money and then go try to have a failed legal career. It's backwards. <laughs> yeah, Kids but it's these it, days. His dad's bankrolling it. So that has, that's how that Oh. oh! Uh, all right. Anyway, you guys have to go podcast with Danny and, and Bud. Tell them we said hello. Keep up the great work on Cover Three. Oh, and this isn't the Cover Three podcast. Thanks for listening to both yeah. the Cover Three, yeah, both and of three podcasts. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, would, I don't know where I am, Chip. I'll see you tonight. All right. I, would, I would say hi to Sean.